The initial idea was written about 20 years ago, just after the eclipse of 1999, where the whole world went to Cornwall. Um, and saw some clouds. Yeah. <laughs> and Nick Dark, who's there's a little dedication at the end of the film to, he, um, I pitched the idea to him, this idea of a, a film about um, sort of like a civil war that broke out during the summer holidays be between the locals and, and the incomers. And it was supposed to be a sort of allegory, and it ended with this huge battle where the... Um, military came in and just carpet bombed the whole place and then <laughs> that was my and then you drew that back I drew it back a little bit yeah that was, with, that was the hypothetical film with the hypothetical budget and, uh, and then I came up with an idea that it was about this uh, fisherman who had had an affair with um, somebody who'd come down on holiday he'd realised that he wasn't going to have anything to do with them because they'd gone back up country he'd yeah. kind of written himself like, rather pathetically out of that out of their story but he borrowed a video camera and was going to make a video diary of his life so that he could send that videotape to his unborn child when they were old enough to understand what it was that he did. And so he starts filming for a summer, gets out a video camera to record his way of life, and then realises that his way of life doesn't exist anymore or is being compromised. The, and then the camera also operates as a catalyst for everybody in the community to come and give their point of view to him. Yeah. So it was effectively a found footage film up until about 10 years ago. And then the idea of a camera being something that people w would be drawn to yeah. as something unusual kind of died when the iPhone came out. So that whole con <laughs> conceit was gone. Um, about the same time I started thinking, uh, or started moving back to working with film yeah. again. And uh, this project was on the shelf effectively. And um, I was looking for a new project um, kind of hooked up with early day films, um, Lim Waite and Kate Byers, was looking for a project and I thought this would be a really inappropriate film to make in this way because it's a video diary film or a script for a video, video diary full of dialogue and lots of dialogue is a nightmare for me in the way that I work. So I, I rewrote it according to how I would make it shot on film and so the whole premise, the whole world of the film really changed, but the theme stayed the same, and the theme survived this 20-year development that uh, I think was the thing that gave us all the confidence to think there's, a, there's something at the heart of this that isn't just about a little village in, in Cornwall. And what, for you, is that central theme? Can you...? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> um, well, it's about alienation, I think, and I think that's why it may have struck a chord at the moment <laughs> that when people feel they've got no power and a bit alienated, what you know, it manifests itself in 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 sort of unpleasant ways with horrible results. There was a review in the Guardian after the film played in in, in Berlin, in which I think Peter Bradshaw sort of explicitly said, "There's a kind of." You know, it, it, it is of our times and that it is, it is a film about the moment. I have to say that I think that one of the things that, that works about it so well is, is that it actually feels fairly timeless. I think you can tell that story at any... You can read into it whatever you want. But the fact that it was a 20-year gestation kind of makes sense. Yeah, and we, when, we had the pre when we had the North American premiere in New York, um, a woman came up to me at the end of the screening who was a New Yorker, and she said, you've made a film about my dad and he was a fisherman in Barbados mm -hmm. all of his life. So that, that, was, that was a nice moment to think, you know, you're not making a parochial little story on the coast of Cornwall. Yeah. Tell me something about the, the technical side of it, because, I mean, obviously the whole film is, is shot on 16mm and it's shot completely silent, right? So every single sound is post-synced. Yes. Yeah, so it's a clockwork camera, same age as me, 1976. Um, it's incredibly simple, it's incredibly idiosyncratic, so depending on how the camera feels on the day, it will run at whatever frame rate. I can, <laughs> I can dial in a frame rate, but the, the final decision rests with the camera. <laughs> I think that depends on how much we've used it that day, the humidity, you know, whatever. And so it, the frame rate really does change? Yeah, it weaves around a little bit. You can hear it, I, you know, I'll be doing a shot and I, the camera's right next to me and the pitch will go up and down. And, I think this is going to be a fun bit to do the ADR for. Um, 
and then, and so it makes a hell of a lot of noise as well. So you, you can't record dialogue. And I and I love you know the, not recording not recording any location sound was born out of the limitations of mm. the camera. But what it then offers in the in the edit suite is this complete freedom. So having worked with low budgets and recorded location sound in the past and done you know, live mixing, mm. a lot of the post production work you do with sound is fixing stuff. Which, is a, which I think is a terrible starting point for a creative process to go in to do the sound design, which is at least 50% of the film, I would yeah. argue more, to start on day one going, right, what have we got to mend? Which aeroplane have we got to, you know, which scene we've got to remove the aeroplane from? What, you know, what scene are we going to move the, remove the fridge sound from and stuff? So to have nothing, it's great to add stuff in. So the signature sound bed for Martin's kitchen mm -hmm. is a fridge. So actually, added a fridge in, it's the first thing I did. Yeah. And, th and then I lift it and lower it and control it in order to raise the tension within the scene. And then, yeah, and then the, I mean, the big thing is replacing all the dialogue, which is done kind of late, late on. But it's extraordinary because you cut the film, you, you lip read the silent uh, footage and you edit it basically as a, as, as, as a lip read silent film that you then go back. I mean, it, it, you, it would be impossible to think of a more complicated way of doing this. <laughs> Yeah, if you if you do think of one, let me know because I'll, <laughs> I'll do that next time. Um, yeah, so I, I have a version of the film that's silent, and, and the sound beds are in, but there's no dialogue. But because I can lip read really well, I can now. Yeah. <laughs> so careful. Um, so I I got all the voices in my head, not in my head, in the uh, yeah I can hear all the voices of the characters while yeah. I'm watching it silently, and then I'll. You know, as we mentioned earlier, I'll, I'll then do an edit. Um, I'll, there will be an edit where it'll be mostly my voice, voicing all of the characters to get the rhythm of dialogue scenes, yeah. which, as I always say, is, is personally my favourite version, favorite of, the version of the film. Your favourite version of the film, yeah. But, I mean, t t so presumably every member of the cast then has to go in and, and re-sync themselves to silent. I mean, that's not something that everyone can do. They can. OK, well, there we go. Then <laughs> yeah. the no, because they're brilliant. Because the thing is... I mean, one thing, they all know that's going to be the process. Mm -hmm. so, and some people are more nervous about it than others. Um, but the thing is, we're quite limited in the way that we speak because of the shapes of the inside of our mouths and the way our lips move and all of that kind of stuff. So it's actually quite difficult to say something in your voice and make it sound different in two, in two takes, okay. if that makes sense. So they, they come in and, you know, there's, most of it's huge close-ups, so they can see... What, what is being said, and it's and I think, I mean, I'm speaking for the actors who might be saying, no, it was an absolute nightmare, but we didn't... I spoke to them before, they said it's an absolute nightmare. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Were they all out of sync? No, I'm lying, they right. this, well, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> they went, <laughs> nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I th you know, I think um, what, what, it ac what it's actually taught me is how little you can adjust the performance. Okay. The first time I did this with Bronco's House, mm -hmm. there were a couple of scenes that we rushed, and I just, I said um, to a couple of actors, if you fluff a line on this take, just keep moving your mouth, <laughs> and I'll sort it. But actually what happens is the, the lights go out in people's eyes, <laughs> and so the, the whole intonation and the whole meaning of the dialogue, the whole subtext of the dialogue is done with the eyes, yeah. and, so, and you can't mess with that really. You can, there's a couple of moments with Ed, Ed scenes where we had to sort of make it slightly more menacing or slightly less menacing within the dialogue, but there's a tiny little margin that you can operate within, really, because the, the performance is set physically yeah. on the day, which I was a bit worried about when we came to voice it, and I realised I couldn't tweak it, but then also well, it's great because it just shows that Actually, everything is set in that moment when the camera's running, when everybody's energies are yeah. concentrated. And that was really reassuring to know that. You were tweeting pictures of boxes of film, because each reel of film is how many minutes? Uh, about two and a half minutes of usable Fine. footage, okay. yeah. So and you tweeted this picture of like a crate with all these different things, I think when you, maybe when you just finished doing the shoot, and it just looked like a, a monumental undertaking. And the thing that's lovely about the film is you can start watching it in terms of almost looking at it as a piece of animation and being staggered by the amount of work that goes into it. But you can also completely forget that. And, because, and I, it's interesting, this is the third time I've seen it now, but it's the first time I've seen it projected. And I think it is a different experience projected. 
projected the, the narrative. Right. Better? Different. Oh, okay. Just different because right. the... No, I mean, I think it's... You know I think it's wonderful. I think it's a masterpiece. I think you've, you know, you've excelled yourself. And I think it's, it's a really, really important piece of work. Congratulations. Have I blown enough smoke up your ass? Yeah. I really, really <laughs> love the film. So, just... Sorry to pardon the pun, but I wasn't fishing for that then. <laughs> so my wife once said about me, she said, you don't fish for compliments, you troll for them. Um, no, I, lo I love it, but I think what's interesting is that, it, is that it, it was more narrative this time. The story was, because the first couple of times I was watching, I was just so astonished by the technical uh, element of it. I love how textural it is. I mean, it does feel, you can feel the filmmaker's fingerprints, right down to the fact that I asked you, did you put any of those scratches in deliberately, or is that literally just how it came out? Yeah, but no, and I said, no, that's my best effort at processing it as clean as possible. I, I watch it now, and I, there's, there's some rolls of film, there's some shots that I know are from a roll where I clearly was wearing a woolly jumper on the day that I processed it, because I can see the, clo <laughs> the clothes fibres. There's another bit where the, the shots of the fish you know, when he puts yeah. the fish in the plastic bags and hangs them on the door, those shots have got this sparkly, glittery thing on them. And when I, when I looked at that, I thought, what the hell is that? And was really a bit disturbed that I didn't know why that had happened. Yeah. And I thought, you know, it can't be something to do with, wrong with the camera. Was it a rogue roll of film? But it seemed... And then I realised that it was a roll that I'd hung up to dry and I'd left the door of the studio open, and it's pollen that's come in and will forever be in the emulsion of the film. Wow. So I, I do like... Um, yeah, you know, you, I think you could probably literally see some fingerprints on that. And, and the whole film you developed in your studio in Newlyn? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In a, in a small rewind tank, 100 feet at a time, winding it backwards and forwards for about three months. Is it possible to say anything about, you know, who you've been influenced by? I know you've become friends with Andrew Cotting, but that's kind of, you know, after the fact. Who were the people that, that, that influenced you? Um, it's difficult to tell who influenced me and who I now think influenced me based on what people have told me in question and answer sessions. Okay. People who sort of say, oh, I can clearly see... Um, Bresson. Well, I would say Bresson, actually, I know, yeah, Bresson. Just because I just said it, that's right. Right, yeah, <laughs> yeah Bre Bresson. <laughs> Um, no, Bresson's always yeah, an influence. Yeah. I mean, the two, the two people I always think about, and this is really cliched and pretentious, but is... Um, Bresson and Tarkovsky. Um, and I think I take a bit from both of them. Um, but I think if they... I think they would both totally reject this film. You know, if they, I'd like to check the ego out. I've just imagined a situation where Bresson and Tarkovsky are sat watching my film. Um, but I think for, you know... Um, <laughs> Tarkovsky wouldn't like the editing. Bresson wouldn't like... Um, the non-linear, yeah. you know, the trickiness of it. Um, and, and Nick Rogue's a massive influence, yeah. obviously, but I think, Nick, you know, I think Nick Rogue's just pure film. So I think Nick Rogue's an influence in the same way that my subconscious is an influence. Because it's interesting, because we're playing this tonight, and I think Don't Look Now is playing in one of the other screens tonight. And there is certainly at the, at the beginning when you get those flash forwards, when you see a whole bunch of things that will happen later on. Yeah. And that is very, very much like the beginning of Don't Look Now, in which the whole story is told in yeah. the first. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, six minutes of the beginning of Don't Look Now, that's it. I think there should be, you know, we have a lot of film studies degrees. There should be a, a degree that's an undergraduate degree of three years on the first six minutes of <laughs> Don't Look Now. Because it's, it's, it is just all there. It's the first six minutes of Don't Look Now and the last 12 minutes of La Jean, Bresson's last film. I think. <laughs> I'll be fine. What was the what was the most difficult thing, and and do you what are you most proud of about it? Um, oh God, the, I think the most difficult, personally, and I know other you know Kate and Linda producers will have other ideas of what the most difficult thing was, like yeah. raising money to make a film like this in the first place, which is which I think is quite tricky. Um, but just getting to the end of it and watching it with a, a handful of people and realizing that it worked that was the sort of the that i mean that's not answering your question but that's the that was the moment where the pressure kind of yeah. was released i had a moment in in berlin i mean yeah it's 20 years sort of you know i didn't work on this every day for 20 years no, that would sure, be crazy it's, but it's been in my head for 20 years in that time um 
we lost Nick Dark, who was my great mentor. Yeah. Also, the film's dedicated to Laura Hardman, who was the producer, a very good friend of mine, who was the pr producer and died very suddenly when we were almost ready to right. make it in in the old incarnation. Um, and I, d you know, I hadn't, I wasn't thinking about this all the time, but I think that combined with coming from a, a shoot where everything's very, you're surrounded by people and support, and then going into a dark studio for three months alone with my thoughts and a rewind tank, winding it backwards and forwards every time I lift the lid off the tank, thinking I hope this roll's come out because you know we don't have a film if we haven't got it all. Yeah. So to get to the end of that and go to Berlin and have the world premiere in a 660-seater theatre and then get the response. It, the, the next morning, um, I was in the, the hotel room and I was re getting ready to go out and do an interview, you know, which this was all new to me. And my iPad, Twitter, was just notification after notification. People I didn't know commenting on the film and I just read this one tweet from this German guy who had like 15 followers or something and he'd just written this tweet and sent it out to the world and it said something like, you know, if you're going to watch one film in Berlin, watch Bait and had this little summary of it and Mary, my partner, was in the room next door and she said, what time have you got to go? And I went to speak and I'd read this tweet and I couldn't talk and she, and she said, you're right? I said, yeah, um, um, I feel happy um, and I could see myself in the mirror. I said, I feel happy, I look sad, and I think I'm about to cry. <laughs> and she walked in, and I just cried for about five minutes like a baby. And it was like the relief yeah. of, of just thinking, get all of the amazing support and collaboration of all these people coming on board and giving their time for, you know, everybody was paid but a, a huge amount of energy for not a lot of money, working really long hours for this batshit, crazy idea of how to make a film. I, you know, we've got no monitors or anything like that. I look through the viewfinder, I'm the only person who knows if we've got the shot or not. I can turn around to somebody and say, do you think we got that? You know, I'm shooting a close up. And I turn around to somebody, no monitors. They go, I don't know. I was looking at a wide shot, <laughs> you know. They, you know, so that I think the pressure, I didn't realize the pressure that I think I was yeah. putting myself under. And presumably you don't shoot a lot of coverage because you've got two and a half minutes of film. You shoot the shot and if you've got it, you move on. I, 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 I watch the film in my head beforehand and I just shoot those shots that I see. And so, that, yeah, there's no coverage. There's one take and one safety. And then I get in the edit and some things work and some things don't work. But the beauty of shooting like this is I have a bit of film at the beginning of each role that may or may not have been fogged when I loaded the film. So I don't want to waste that but I also don't want to shoot anything really important on it. So if I was shooting a scene with me and you chatting, I'd shoot a cutaway of a bottle, yeah. um, uh, you know, a couple hundred extras who are here. You know, I'd shoot a few things, and then at the end of the roll, I might have five feet left, which isn't enough to do another take. Yeah. But again, I don't want to throw it away, so I might get a shot of your shoes or my feet or something like that. And then I'll try and work those cutaways into the scene to make the scene work, which is why the film looks like it looks. Like yeah. the, the figureheads in the pub, they were shot at the beginning and end of roles. Right, they weren't yeah. in the script. I didn't notice them when we wrecked the pub, but when we were getting ready to shoot, I'd just go get a shot, get these close-ups. And suddenly, when I was looking at the rushes, I realized, and this is an Andrew Cotting expression that I think he got for me in Sinclair, the angels of happenstance have turned up, and they help you out. And I realized that there were doppelgangers, ev everybody in that scene mm -hmm. in a figurehead around the pub. If I wasn't making a film and quite stressed, I think I probably would have been quite freaked out by it. <laughs> but <laughs> it was just, it was all there. You know, and, and also, like a, a random cutaway can suddenly turn a scene into something else. So when when a headbutts Tim outside the house and does a runner, yeah. it cuts to a wide shot of the police car to set up the fact that she's been arrested. Mm. I also had a close-up that I just shot on the end of a roll of handcuffs being put on. So I could have opened that scene of her being arrested with the handcuffs going on, but it kind of ruined the reveal of the police car, which yeah. worked much better. But because I've shot on film, you know, we've paid for that bit of film, the film's been through the camera, I've heard it go right past my ear, and then I've, I've had it in my hands and I've processed it, I've hung it up to dry, all that kind of stuff. I don't want to throw it away. It's not a virtual thing, it's an object. Mm. So I then try and cut that in. So then that shot, the handcuffs yeah. being put in, I thought, well, that, it could go later in the film and be a flashback and that has one meaning, you know, to remind people yeah. or the context might slightly change, so it takes on a slightly different meaning. But I dropped in as a, as, as a flash forward, and then it means something else. So then 
that moment, it's, it becomes, for me anyway, it becomes sort of metaphorical. Mm -hmm. it's, it signifies her... Being trapped. Being trapped, yeah, yeah. And, and fate and all of that kind of stuff. And I never would have done that if it wasn't shot on film, and I never would have shot it unless I was shooting 100-foot rolls that I have these beginnings and ends that I need to yeah. use. The Angels of Happenstance thing is, I do think it's a brilliant idea, and I, and I think that the, when you look at that kind of film and you see those chance moments, which is where the, the real magic of it lies, I think you do have to believe in some kind of you know, movie god or movie fate. Would you make another feature uh, in the same way, or are you done with that now? What's No, the next one we're doing the same. It's a... Um, 87 minute horror film I've done it in exactly the same way can you tell us anything about the um, it's colour this time it's about a, a woman who is alone on an island off the Cornish coast in 1973 and she's there as a volunteer to monitor a very rare flower that only grows on this island in the waste of a tin mine that used to be there and the only other thing on the island is a, a standing stone and it's, the island is called Stone Island or in Cornish Ennis Men and it's about her relationship with this stone that may or may not be gradually moving towards her house. And, you're, and you've begun production on it already? or No, we're just um, developing it at the moment. Okay. So the script's in development, the sort of... Um, I'm way out of my comfort zone here. The sort of finance packaging is okay. being packaged <laughs> in a finance way. Right. I'm going to pull you back into the comfort zone in that case. I know this sounds like a naff question. Can you say something about Cornishness and what that means to you? Um, well, it, kind of, it goes back to Nick Dark, really. Um, my, uh, Cornishness growing up was something that was... Certainly I wasn't particularly aware of, proud of, or, and it wasn't something that was celebrated, really, in the sort of 80s when I was young. And then I moved away to go to college... And I went from being not very Cornish, and then I went, as soon as I stepped over the border, I became the most Cornish person in the world. <laughs> and then I noticed there are other people from Cornwall, in London and Bournemouth, where I was living, yeah. who were also just as Cornish as me, <laughs> and they'd, they'd become Cornish through being away. Yeah. And, uh, and I think Nick was the one who kind of promoted the idea of Cornishness as a progressive thing, not as an isolationist yeah. kind of thing. And, and, and uh, you know, the word nationalism, which is... is worse and worse connotations but a kind of pride in where you're from and a celebration of the different differentness differentness mm -hmm. yeah of um and and the ish is the important thing i was told what do you call nish we've got an ish like the scottish and the irish and the welsh -ish. <laughs> and the welsh -ish, yeah. <laughs> they don't need one <laughs> so so do you think that the film is about identity about Cornish identity or do you, because the thing is what's what I think is fascinating is quite apart from that and I do genuinely think it's a brilliant piece of work and I'm not alone in thinking that I mean I've, I've seen so many rave reviews now I think it's been embraced in Cornwall particularly as an authentic piece of homegrown art because heaven knows there have been enough inauthentic it has been embraced as an authentic piece of art but nobody's seen it in Cornwall yet so that's based on the trailer and what people have said about Like yourself, you know, mentioning bait whilst reviewing Fisherman's Friends. The idea that there's something, you know, not to... I'm not slagging that film off at all. I haven't no, seen no, it sure. and, I, you know, and it's, it's, it's done very well and got good reviews. But there's a, a, a tradition, and it's not just in Cornwall. It's in a lot of the regions where you use a specific location as a backdrop for somebody else's story. And it's usually a, a story where somebody who is troubled arrives and they don't realize they're troubled, but through this interaction with simple folk, they realize that they were troubled and they simplify their life, but on a slightly different level than the simple folk who are not aware that they're simple. Yeah. That can be done well. <laughs> if you look at something like <laughs> Local Hero, for example, yeah, yeah. which is just, you know, perfection. Wonderful. Yeah. But there are... Uh, and I was asked this in a in an early Q and A, you know what the how important the portrayal of Cornwall was, and I said I wanted to bring the Cornish people to the foreground. So rather than being in the background and being a shortcut for sort of simplicity or stupidity yeah. or you know everybody's related and their cousin marrying sort of yeah, yeah. yokels and all that kind of stuff, I said it's really important to get rid of that and bring the 
Cornish characters to the front. Next question, somebody said, how did you cast the film? And I said, well, my partner plays Sandra. Her son, Isaac, who's here, plays Neil. Neil's dad in the film is played by his actual dad, who's Sand who personally plays Sandra, who's Mary's ex-husband. <laughs> and then you've got the sort of, his best man there, when they got married, plays the cab driver, you know, and then, yeah, yeah. And I was going on, and then it was, the answer was fizzing out. And then, oh, and then there's yeah, the, the woman who comes down to stay with the baby. She's, the, she's my partner's niece. And so it, everybody, except for Simon Shepard, I think, who's also here, I think everybody in the film is related. <laughs> <laughs> so it's diff it is difficult <laughs> to... Um, but I think that's, you know... It's the strength of community. There's an interesting thing, though, about you know, the, the, the portrayal of, of uh, Cornwall on film, because I did a thing recently that you'd commented on to it. I'd gone up to um, you know, Tor Noon, um, Solomon's Isle, to, to where the house where Straw Dogs was filmed. And, of course, Straw Dogs, on the one hand, is that absolutely classic, you know, we go somewhere and, every, and it is all that stuff. Mm. But there is still something about Straw Dogs, because you, 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 on the way that I always get lost when I try and find that house. Oh, somebody came running towards you across a field. Somebody came running, waving, but in a kind of weird, slightly threatening, but maybe not threatening way. But there is, whatever, whatever else that film gets wrong, it does get something right about the landscape, about that feeling that you are in a different place. Yeah. Even if you grew up there, it still feels yeah. different. And the West Penwith Moor is something, yeah. something else. There's something going on out there. That, <laughs> you know, Sven Berlin, the great artist who well, he spent his later years in the New Forest and spent his yeah. mid-period in, in St. Ives. He wrote the book The Dark Monarch, which is about, you know, Dark Monarch is the thing that he thinks lived at Carn Galva yeah. out, on, out on the moor. And there is something really strange out there. And we're going to... Um, that's where we're going to shoot the, the horror film. Oh, so it's going to be set on an island, but it will all be using West Penwith Moor. And we, and we keep discussing possible locations, and then it's, it's quite funny, because you say, what about that cottage up by... Um, you know, up by that tour, and they say, yeah, it looks great, and we'll look at photos and go and have a look, and then somebody will say, oh, but that's got the curse of so-and-so on it. And you look <laughs> into it and you go, oh, yeah, like five people did die after they, <laughs> after they talked about that cottage. And so it's, there's, there's definitely a lot of super... And I'm incredibly... Super, anybody who worked on the film know how superstitious I am. I mean, the, the timings for the developing of the film, the, yeah. the temperature was 21 degrees, the developer, and the, and the time in the developer was 17 minutes, and that's based on my... Two lucky numbers, not based on any science. Oh wow! So there's, you know, I've got another superstition where you don't, we don't cast one of the characters until about ten minutes before we need them, and then get somebody in very. Do you last ever look minute. at a new moon through glass? Why does that? Why have I heard of? Were you talking about that? Because you can't do that. It's very bad luck. That's an Isle of Man thing, right? Well, my grandfather did it. He would never look at a new moon through glass. He would go and stand out and turn a walnut over in his pocket to stop him getting arthritis. He would give a <laughs> shilling to my, you know. Yeah, and never had arthritis. Never had arthritis, that's right, absolutely. So it perfectly worked. Well, the previous film, Bronco's House, was it wasn't set in Mausel, but I shot the whole thing in Mausel. And what happened was I, we, well, we pissed everybody off when we were shooting it. And then when it was finished, some people took it as a, as a comment on Mausel and maybe even projected themselves into different characters. So this time I was really keen to do something that was more of a, a composite and actually not name where it is. I mean, we, Cornwall isn't even named in the, in, the, in the film. And I keep saying that in Q&As, and I did notice that he does have a T-shirt on that says Cornish, oh. really big. <laughs> so it's just a bit of a lie. Um, on a practical level, Charlestown is set up to be a, a, a sort of film lo a filming location. Um, so Kate and Lynn got a great deal through um, the guy who owned the, the harbour at the time to use the outer harbour, because what, as you know, people go to Charlestown to film the inner harbour and you can dress it as whatever period you like, and there's the, the tall ships in there and all that kind of stuff, and that's what companies go and pay a fortune for. And what we wanted to, what we wanted to uh, use was the contemporary, modern outer harbour. So most people go there and shoot the inner harbour and hide the outer harbour, and we 
and we went there and shot the outer harbour and hid this amazing inner harbour because you couldn't have a you know this family drama going on. You, you can't have the audience going, oh, "What's that tall ship in the background?" And there is actually a reflection in the in the wheelhouse window at one point of a of a tall ship, but I don't, nobody's sort of said they've noticed it yet. So it was it was a practical thing really, and then. All the other places are just, you know, a lot of it was shot in Penzance, Senan, um, a bit away from the harbour at Charlestown, but we kind of built, um, the art department built a, a fake front door that we could have on the harbour side. So it was, it was practical reasons, really. And, and we, had the, we had the beach as well, so we could, we could close the harbour effectively and, and have access to the beach. Um, thank you ever so much, everybody, for coming along. Uh, thanks to the BFI for showing the print, which looked really fabulous, the 35mm print, didn't it? Yeah, and please join me in thanking Mark and indeed everyone here from the cast and crew of Fate. Thank you. Thanks very much.